Hi, so in this video here, I'm going to show you sort of the basics of GAC. These four things here, uh, registering the um, DLL into the GAC and the search order and how to actually do it in production because in production, you actually don't have the GAC util unless you install the Visual Studio SDK. Um, so how to properly do that in production. Uh, I'm going to warn you, this is a pretty boring GAC uh, sort of video and uh, it's pretty tedious but it'll give you some insight into sort of the search order and how to alter it. Uh, so here um, I have the awesome app and the awesome app is a console app that's going to call two DLLs. So the two DLLs it's going to call is here. One is the signed and one is the unsigned and it basically it's going to get the version numbers of the uh, DLLs and display it for you and um, here I have the signed version and I am gonna prefix this with dot awesome signed and GAC and I have the version number at uh, 1.0.0.0 and the reason why I'm doing that is because I'm actually gonna register this into the GAC and then I'm gonna create a local one and I'm gonna show you that it actually always gets the one from the GAC if you have the uh, DLL that's signed. So I'm going to go ahead and I am going to rebuild and it's going to create this here and I'm going to register it in, in the GAC. So the GAC where it is is it's in it's on the Windows Microsoft.net assembly and you'll see here there's uh, three areas the 32-bit, the 64-bit native and then there's the intermediate language compilation which is where mine's is going to go. So I'm going to register this DLL and you'll see it in the background show up in the GAC. So I'm going to register here and you'll see now it shows up and the version that I registered is 1.0.0.0 and this is the token. So what does that mean? If, if I go into a inspector of the assembly you'll notice this is the awesome app and in the manifest file here you'll see let me reload this actually let me so you'll see here that after it's reloaded this is the version number and this is the public token that I have and you'll see that here right there so that's how you identify when you're compiling a DLL, what DLLs it references and what is the strong name of the DLL. So you'll notice in my console app, I actually do not have it signed because the public key token is null. Whereas uh, this is the signed DLL that it references, the signed one here. And here's the public key token, the key that I use to sign it. And then here's the unsigned and it doesn't have a public key token because I didn't, un I didn't sign it. Um, so um, to show you that this actually uh, references the uh, GAC version, uh, keep in mind I have uh, that prefixed. So let me go and execute this now. And you'll notice it says the GAC because it's getting the version from the GAC. And I'll show that again by deleting this local version. And you'll notice it gets the one from the GAC. Now I'm going to change this to be local. So this is the local version. I'm going to recompile. And you'll notice it actually won't copy it here because it's in the GAC. The strong name that it references is already in the GAC, so it actually doesn't compile here, which is not something I expect because you'll you'll notice here, if I go to the properties, I actually told it to copy local, but it still couldn't, didn't copy it local. Um, so I have to do that manually. I'm going to go into the awesome app, go to the signed bin folder, copy this and put it back in this location and you'll see this is the local version so if I call this if it was calling that local version it would actually output this but as you'll notice 
when I execute this here, it actually outputs the one in the GAC. Now, uh, to show you, uh, let's see, that it will actually get the local one after I delete this. Um, I have that locked, so let me try again, and it deletes it. And I'm gonna execute this here. And now it says local because it's getting the local one. Um, so the other thing I wanna show is the side-by-side -side versioning. So um, let me do that by recreating this. So you'll notice the timestamp here is 535. I'm gonna change this back to the GAC because I'm gonna register two different side-by-side -side versions in the GAC. Um, so let me compile. And now because it's not in the GAC, it actually, notice it actually compiled and it put those versions in here. And um, so normally you would use the GAC Util. If, if you were on a development machine that had the Visual Studio SDK, be, because after .NET 2.0, the GAC Util is not um, distributed with the .NET framework. So what's going to happen is um, if you're in production, you won't be able to use the GAC Util unless you actually copy the GAC Util into your, your uh, deployment script. But that's actually not recommended. It's actually recommended that you uh, do it use via PowerShell. But I'm going to still register this using the GAC Util and show you how to do it via the PowerShell later. So I've registered this and it says it's added and I could double check. I go to the GAC Util and it's added here. Now um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to change the version number and I'm going to change it to 2.0 and I'm going to recompile. And if you remember, before it was 37, now it's 38. So I'm going to register this one also. And let's see what happens here. In the GAC, now I have the 2.0 version side by side with the 1.0 version. And if I double click, you'll see that's the signed. And this is the same exact name. And if I go back into my dot peak, um, and I refresh this here. You'll notice now it's compiled against the 2.0. So this is a very handy tool uh, to inspect the uh, .NET assemblies. Uh, it's from JetBrains and it's called .peak and it, you can download that for free. And I'm gonna actually create a third one here, a 3.0. and register that one also. And I'm gonna do this a little bit differently. I'm, I'm gonna use uh, the PowerShell to register it. So I'm gonna copy my DLL in here. And uh, the script that I have to install it is actually a PowerShell script. And you'll notice all I'm doing is calling the .NET assemblies. So this is the .NET assembly that I'm using to register it into the GAC. And this is the location of my file. So that's the location of my file. And what I'm going to do here is simply run the command. So the command that I have is um, install.powershell uh, script1. And you'll notice that's registered now. And if I double check, so that's how you should do it in production is use these PowerShell scripts. And I'm going to include these two scripts in the um, description section. So now that I have three registered, I'm going to show you uh, how to override the versioning. So um, if you notice, the if I go into dot p here, you'll, you'll notice if I refresh this. that it's, piled against, it's compiled against the 3.0 version. So I'm gonna run it now. I'm gonna show you in my app config here, 
I just have a normal app config. It just has the framework version and that's about it. And so I'm gonna run this here. And you'll notice it gets the 3.0 version because that's what it was compiled against. And um, how do I override that? Well, I override that by putting this in. So, so I'm gonna uncomment this here. And I'm gonna show you that what I'm saying here is I'm overriding this version and it should reference 1.0. So you'll, you'll see this is the name of the assembly. That's the token. And again, you can get that simply by looking at the reference here. So that's the version that it's referencing in one of these reflection tools of the uh, inspecting the assembly. So now I'm gonna save this. And again, this is my .config file. So if I go in here and edit, you see now I have this overriding the... So these bottom things are, uh, I'm gonna demonstrate later, but you'll notice here I overwritten what the version number it should reference, which uh, originally points to 3.0.0.0. And you could specify a range here, in which case uh, I specified a uh, arbitrary range, uh, 3.1. And that old version should reference this new version, which actually is older than the new version. So that's a little bit confusing, but um, I, I think you, you get it here. So um, let me do that. I'm going to execute this. And you'll notice now it references 1.0. So... Um, if I change this here, it's going to reference 2.0. So you notice now it references 2.0. So uh, that that's how it works, and um, you know that that's really about it for redirecting the references. So I'm going to uncomment this out now, and. Um, you'll notice now it goes back to referencing 3.0, which is what it was compiled against. Uh, so the other thing I want to show is the code base. So I am going to delete 3.0 here from the GAC. And this is 3.0, I believe. Um, but I could run it, and you'll see okay it's uh, actually getting it's not getting the one from the GAC it's actually getting the one here uh, that's a little bit confusing so let me recompile this so this is 3.0 and I'm gonna change the code here that this is the local version and I'm gonna compile this okay so now when I run this it's getting the local version because uh, if you remember I deleted the one from the GAC. However, if I take this and I copy it in here, when I run it, it's gonna give an exception because it can't find it. And so that's when I use the probing. So uh, an alternative is uh, this code base. You could specify a code base here, um, but it has to be an href, so it's gonna be HTTP in some URL. And the file, the file command uh, doesn't actually work here. So if I do something like this, it actually does not work. Let me demonstrate that. You'll notice that doesn't work. However, if I uncomment this and I tell it to probe, that is, um, look at the subdirectory, my bin, which is here, you'll notice um, it made a liar out of me. Um, because I didn't comment this out. So let me do that here, comment this out, and hopefully 
it works and it does work. So that's that's how the probing command works. And again, I'm going to have all of this in the description section. So, um, but that really sort of concludes the demo. I, I hope this gives you a little insight on, again, um, you know, so, some of the order of precedence of the GAC and how to register the GAC in production. I think those those are the two main issues here. And also that if you register a DLL of the same version, it'll actually overwrite it. It'll overwrite this old one. So you really do want to increment your versions, but make sure it's uh, in a consistent version name because uh, if you're dealing with this in production, lots of times you do want to know exactly what version of software you have in production. Uh, sometimes it's just convenient to uh, compile everything as 1.0 but that's actually not uh, best practices so alright uh, thank you so much for watching and uh, I hope this helps uh, it's a pretty tedious video um, but I hope you got through it and uh, thank you for watching